floor to discussion. I would like to bring together a few points, not only from today's presentations, but also from the two documentaries that we watched last night, as of course they are relevant to what we've just heard. The third motherland raised the issue of being caught up between two conflicting nationalisms. The issue of having to side with a particular ethno-religious group in order to survive. The silencing of the individual metaphorical voice of that group and the consequent threat to that group's actual voice, that is, people's language. The shifting perspectives with regard to language that we saw in the documentary, again, so good, bad, something to be ashamed of, etc., are indicative of people's shifting perspectives with regard to where they belong and where they choose to turn to when looking for a motherland. Bukabarane raised the issue of another silent community, one that is similarly caught up in other ethnic groups and tangled politics and nationalisms. So used is the community we are introduced to here to experiencing happy events with war or violence raging in the background, that the issue of peace over a happy occasion, such as a wedding, seems as unimaginable to them as jumping over the rainbow. The tragedy that we feel here comes precisely from the juxtaposition of such a simple and, for most people, easily reachable thing, peace during a personal celebration with something that is possible only in the sphere of the imagination, that is, jumping over the rainbow. Sonocities raised the issue of the different ways of approaching cultural history with the help of comp computational techniques and methods. The history of sound <coughs> and sound history is, as we heard, not universal, but a product of a place and time culturally constructed and historically defined. In the first and second papers, the issues of being caught up between conflicting nationalisms, of being caught up in the middle, of being denied one's own identity, were very clear and easy to see. In the first case, there was culture or language violence, if you like. In the second case, there was physical violence as well. The violence in the third paper is not, at first sight, so clear to identify. Yet the case study of the Yenijabi highlighted precisely how the passage from a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-religious society to a monocultural, mono-ethnic, mono-religious one can similarly silence voices and, importantly, how oral with an AU, not alone. So how oral data, so sound in this case, can help us listen to these voices, or in the very least can help make us aware of these voices again. Where in the first two papers we saw how it is vital to look at history, especially the history of minority groups in a different way, away from perceived dichotomies such as we can or we have to belong to either this or that, i.e. were being denied our existence as an independent individual group. In the third paper, we looked at methods for analyzing things differently, for looking at culture-related data through different lenses. So another connecting thread in all three papers was how non-traditional means, such as documentaries or oral sensory history, can be used to tell a story or to narrate history in different ways. And with this, I would like to open the discussion to the floor. So, any questions? Do you have a microphone? Yes. Uh, there are the guests, I thank you very much for your good contribution uh, for this session. Uh, I would like some, to do some assessments and then uh, ask some questions as well. Uh, my friend, you gave us uh, very detailed information about the Maronites in Cyprus, but uh, for my assessment, of course, there are different uh, identities also uh, out of the Maronites, such as 
the Africans uh, assimilated in the Turkish Cypriot community. As we know, 20,000 of them were transported from Africa. One family, uh, according to a census made in uh, 1920, only one family accepted Christianity and Greek Cypriot identity in Lanaka. Uh, I'm talking to you about uh, a researcher uh, who made a personal, individual research uh, about the Africans. And then about 20,000 of the Africans assimilated in the Turkish Cypriot community. Of course, probably there are some claims that they came uh, from Africa as the uh, believers of Islam, and then that's why. And of course, the Ottoman uh, Empire, the Ottoman culture gave them facilities, uh, as you know. They were not such as the Islams, as we saw in the United States, that tortured or harassed by the people, but the Ottomans accepted them as the owners or, uh, or the women's praise or something just like that, and gave them bureaucratic uh, activities as well. So uh, that is another identity. Cypriot gypsies, we don't know anything about the Cypriot gypsies. Cypriot gypsies as well, they have got their own language. How language? What does it mean, how language? Let's go home. Kaikar. Let's eat. And they speak this, this is the incarnation language, but we have never research about. Anyway, although they sound that they accepted the identity of the Turkish Cypriots, but they have got a very different identity and they are still they are still uh, following their traditions. Uh, Armenians of course. Thank uh, you. And, and this, to Mr. Chilikan, I would like to ask you a question. It was very effective, the film. I heard from the Turkish TV that the film was very effective as well. But uh, could you please tell us some uh, details about the democratic solution and uh, promotion? Uh, do you think that AKP will uh, accept the solution till the end of the uh, governing or uh, the expectations will be made after the elections, new elections, we don't know yet. And my friend, you, I didn't catch up your Sorry, because you used the word of the mass. Did, did you use the mass for renegade people, of course? Did you use the mass for the Jewish people, mostly uh, resettled in Salonika, or you use it instead of the people uh, that accepted uh, Islam in religion from Christianity? Uh, for what kind of people you used the mass? Could you please enlighten us about that? Thank you very much. Thank you. And may I please remind you to keep your questions as brief as possible. And similarly, may I please uh, point out that it would be good to have brief answers as well, so I can take as many questions as possible. Um, you can answer now, and then we can take a question. I don't want to take more questions. I think we'll be answering them in one time. Uh, and have questions on yeah, the very quickly then, uh, you're absolutely right. There are lots of minorities, so there is and the challenge is to have more documentaries, more research. Uh, the Roma or Gypsy community is very interesting. Uh, of course, one of the issues here that we need to bear in mind is that when it comes to minority communities, self-identification is very important. I think we cannot simply impose identities on people who might not feel they are part of their identity. So in the case of the Africans, in the case of the gypsies, some of them may not accept that particular heritage. And it's very important in minority rights not to impose identities on people who don't uh, self-identify. Uh, so I've done some research on the, on the Roma community. Uh, most of them are not open about it. A lot of them don't bother. They don't organize in the way that the Maronites would organize. But it's a fascinating community. In Kurpecha is still being taught in uh, more food resilient. Uh, and Dimasol as well. And Dimasol. Uh, in some of the meetings, they have like several meetings that are abundant in Thank you. Uh, well, I personally want to believe that uh, the peace process uh, will be fruitful and will have a democratic and peaceful solution to the church. Uh, question. 
But as you have mentioned, now the main obstacle is the elections, which we're going to have. So daily politics is, I can say, more dominant than uh, a long-term policy of uh, the process nowadays. Um, I was referring to the to the community of Judaic, um, a Judeo-Spanish speaking. Yes, I mean this is this is a moment in the late seventeenth century with Sabbatai's V and the conversion. Sorry. Exactly, the, 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 there is the, the conversion of uh, and this uh, community from uh, Judaism to Islam, basically. But they had this very interesting particularity of, of being uh, Jews who had been converted and they had uh, uh, continued to maintain not only the Judeo-Spanish Judeo language but also many of, uh, many of its cast, of the customs of the Latino uh, you know, the Sephardic community. So it's an interesting hybridical community in its own, in its own right that uh, by the end of the 19th century was also uh, an elite in, in Salonika, mm -hmm. um, which is, which is uh, something to, to bear in mind. You know, the, the fact that Yeni Jami, again, this eclectic uh, building uh, with, with some spectacular characteristics became, uh, became its mosque uh, in the beginning of the century was attest to the fact that it was quite, it was quite powerful. Uh, <coughs> also in, in, in political terms. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question that follows up very yes. Actually, I, I, 
Uh, I like, uh, it's also about the terms more than that, because I haven't seen uh, that we discussed this before. Uh, anyway, um, my question is the following. I like it very much. I think it's really nice that you, could, you end up with open questions and a very balanced view. And still, my question is whether you have not too much respect for their claim of identity, uh, and whether you shouldn't have questioned the invented tradition uh, behind it a little more. In two ways, I would say. Uh, if we speak about missed chances, but of course it's easy to do that, right? You cannot include everything. But to say it a little provocatively, haven't you been a little uh, too uh, gerontophile? You know, too, yeah. too gerontophile, too much focus on the other thing. I mean, children, children are only, well, it's, 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 the gender aspect is, is problematic. It's not just all the people, but patriarchs, only men. And the children are only passive recipients of things. Of, of education. Now, let's be clear, uh, be honest about this. I, I'm actually on, from a, a quite similar, similar background. I'm a Flemish guy coming from Western Flanders. I'm now living in Eastern Flanders. And I once heard a conversation between two, two guys from Ghent. It's 20 kilometers, no, 50 kilometers away. It's another dialect. I heard two guys in a shop, and the one says to the other, they're coming here, they're all coming here, ruining our culture. I think he's speaking about the Turkish or Moroccan migrants again. <laughs> These Western Flemish guys. <laughs> <laughs> this is ridiculous, guys. I mean, but obviously it is indeed true. For example, in northern France, they're trying to revive Flemish identity. Now, it's a strange experience. You go to northern France, you have this medieval Flemish uh, uh, speak, speaking by the elder people. But of course, it's a way of claiming authority, and uh, people have to learn this. I would say, leave these kids alone. If you say that it was traumatizing for you to be confronted with, uh, with the official language in schools and so on, well, that was bad. Don't do it again, I would say. Just forget about it, you know. I try to communicate and try to make them have their own lives. And uh, as elderly people, I would say, yes, um, it is true. They're forgetting your culture, but give them a chance. It's provocative, but maybe we should think of it in, in, in this way. Uh, and the same, the women, what is their perspective there? Um, yeah. I, I think my question is also related. <laughs> 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 One final question on this, please, and then we yeah, need yeah. to answer this okay. last two okay. uh, Thank you very much for uh, three of the presentations, and the films were very interesting. I, just, I, I feel myself very happy to see both of the films. Uh, my question is about, of course, after 1990s, the rediscovery of the ethnic identities is very important, and everyone is rediscovering their, their ethnic identities, like the legend communities of Benedict Anderson. But uh, it is also bringing a uh, danger of the regeneration of the nationalism, and I'm very afraid about, about this, but I don't think so. We will solve all this together, but we have to see that it is also generating nationalism and increasing the nationalism, especially during the economical crisis and also uh, unemployment uh, periods, because it is increasing. So how we will deal with this issue? I don't think so we will answer, but maybe we should think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. I understand the worry about identity politics and kind of simply empowering new ethnic identities and proliferation of identities that might be manufactured or presented in ways that legitimate particular claims and policies. I agree. At the same time, we need to recognize that in this particular instance, before we move to that, we need to realize in Cyprus the problem of certain identities being considered surplus in Cyprus. Certain ethnic identities have been considered surplus and have been simply pushed over. So first we do that, and then we do what we said, which is absolutely uh, important. I think we did, I don't know how far it came out, I think we did it in Lebanon. By going with these guys to Lebanon, which they idealized and thought, oh, them are we feel at home. You could really see they couldn't fit in, in the world. They couldn't speak Arabic. The Arabic that they will speak, they cannot communicate uh, with the Lebanese. Actually, the Lebanese, something that we didn't show, we, we, we didn't have enough material. 
the Lebanese elites will look down upon these people because they are provincial Maronites. They are not really at court, they will idealize them. In the villages, there is an urban provin uh, provincial identity. Uh, but you, you have seen it also in the past. You know, you have people who get the shivers when we speak of our mother. That's why I was saying some comments were tiny in cheap in terms of our mother. So it was the construction by themselves. So it was not just academics talking about manufacturing of identity. It was the modernists themselves talking about the manufacturing of their own identity. So you have the, the boy there saying, oh, these people, and they agree. They tell you what you want to hear. But actually, they become religious only over three days. Some of them, or some of them, was their first visit to Lima. So I would think that we have managed that. You have been a bit unjust. On us, no, in no, not agree, showing that. I agree with that. I agree with that uh, the gerontophilia <laughs> and so on. I agree, I agree on that. Uh, in some respects, it's inevitable because only old people speak the language. It's a highly endangered language. So, in Gold Magidis, you only get people over now over 40s, 50s who still speak this language. And we wanted to address this issue of the compelling to choose an ethnic identity. We had to go to the old people who remember the 1960s. Women, you are absolutely right, and I should have mentioned it. It was actually something that we were very conscious. It was difficult to get women to talk, again, because of traditional, more uh, provin um, provinces, villages, women. Have you seen some of them simply said, well, we don't know about this thing. We don't want to talk about this thing. Uh, however, younger men, maybe we, we should have been more, more uh, pushy in terms of finding younger, uh, younger women who, who would have been able to. Have all questions been answered? Uh, in terms of nationalism, I think that's something that... Sorry. Uh, my question was about nationalism. How we will deal with increasing, rising nationalism? For example, during this economic crisis of 2007, nationalism against increasing Europe. Uh, I, I, also, it is increasing other than, for example, Russia, other than the Turkish identity, the other identities rediscovered they themselves. Now, uh, when you say that I'm from this origin, and they are saying, are you again to be just uh, like Turks, that you are also against the, the Turkey, and also the nationalism, that we expect socialists to support this process, they are not supporting. Why? Because they are thinking this is a danger for Turkish uh, nation state. Very briefly, in terms of the Maronites, uh, it's not a dangerous nationalist. I mean, there, there's, there's no violence. It's not violent nationalists. You know, we're talking about people who have been denied the right to speak their language indirectly, not directly. So it's very different. They don't have territorial claims. They don't want an independent state. So we are not at that stage with the Maronites. And I, I think, given how I showed the, the, they are integrated, I don't think they have na ethno-nationalist claims in the same sense that, that cares. Uh, I can, I so, uh, the, during the film, I saw that when they were playing football, the national anthem of the uh, cyclists would be sing, and they said that no, it is the Lebanon is enough. But they don't know how to sing that. I mean, they did not know. Only the couple men. The other thing, that, that, that's I mean, how, how we try to deconstruct actually those claims that they were trying to no, I can understand that situation. For example, where I, I'm also a Sitasian origin, and when I go to Abkhazia or Sitasia, and the national anthem of Abkhazia, the countries they play, it, and then you have to sing, and you don't know it. So Thank you. Uh, it is also generating some kind of the national. Thank you. If Murat has a this Well, yes. Uh, this may be a vicious circle in the sense that, first of all, we should not forget that, especially this ethnic religious identity problems are created because of nationalism. The reason of the dominant powers, uh, that the nationalism of the dominant powers gives way to. On the one hand, and on the other hand, I don't know 
Uh, I mean, l let's say the language of the Maronites. I don't know whether the young children should be forced to uh, learn about it, but it's not a problem of the Maronites, it's a problem of the humanity. It's a language which is dying, and we should all be related to it, because it's the culture of the humanity, not only the Maronites. It should not die. I, I mean, why do, the, why do we have that? that um, you will lose all the experience of that culture if the, that language dies. Right now the recorder. If that language dies, then it, you will no more have any books about it. Uh, so I, I believe, I personally believe that there is, there is a problem in this, I can accept it, but uh, we should give uh, that positive discrimination for those suppressed identities, then we can talk about equality. Now when we say that just, why do they learn it, just learn the language of, I mean, the dominant, uh, we're talking about equality for unequal uh, ethnicities or uh, unequal groups. Thank you. One last round of questions, please, and then we have to wrap it up. Yes, please. Thank you. I have a question for the third speaker, the project on sound. So you said you were interested also in the way people would react to sound, the way they would integrate it in the way in order to make a cultural history of sound. And what are the kind of sources we can back on to reenact the, the, the sounds? I understand that you can have an idea, but to understand how people people reacted to the sound. It's a light thing. It's a light thing. Is there a, where do you find this kind of information in more traditional sources? I have a question related to that, so you can make a question. Yes. It's a very interesting and innovative uh, attempt to discover the sounds of uh, the past. Do you think that the historian faces a major problem that is uh, oral uh, archives or the uh, material traces of sound are very uh, difficult to, to, to discover? They are very scarce. For example, we do have uh, Latino songs uh, that have been preserved, but we don't have, uh, do we have sounds, for example, of the voice in? Uh, making the prayer of uh, or of the drum passing, for, for, for example. I mean, is there a difficulty in, in that? Especially if we, we, we try to discover uh, the sounds of everyday life. I mean, people talking. The, so perhaps we are obliged to arrive to the sounds through visual documents. For example, you show us uh, the, 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 the timetable of the words in prayer. Thank you. There was a question at the front, and then Daphne I think, has a question as well, and then you can answer. Thank you for your intervention. And I don't have a question, I have a remark, a general remark, it's not about the intervention. We speak about the public history. And I understand very well for Turkey and Greece to have a combination between academic and public history. I cannot understand for Cyprus at all. Because we have many public stories in Cyprus, many public stories, which is wars of memories or of, uh, of uh, identities, etc. We don't have an academic history. The need, the, the important vacuum in Cyprus is the academic history. I was for 19 years here in Cyprus at the University of Cyprus. And I tried many hard to have a historical thinking. We don't have up to now. So we cannot speak about public history because public history is public stories if it is not the basis, the hard basis, and I'm sorry to use the term hard. We have many things, many terms as given, community, motherland. For the historical, historical analytical thought, there is not, there are not these terms. These terms we can interpret through the analytical instruments of history. We cannot use them as it was a given thing, as it was this, the historical thinking. So for me, mother and 
motherland, for instance, we can interpret, we must, we, the historians, interpret through the notion of transnational actors in a context and in a, in a concrete historical context. And we cannot, uh, it's not for you, it's not for you at all, it's for, for us historians, because we, the historians, we are. Uh, we cannot uh, explain, interpret all these terms uh, up to now. So for me, we need in Cyprus a historical, a historical conference on this, about these terms. Because otherwise we see the history of Cyprus as a particularity. The motherlands, the communities, etc. What means community in a historical thinking? Thank you. Last week? Mm -hmm. And we'll close with this question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just to briefly, uh, my thought about what uh, Sia said, I think in Cyprus, the best history is done by political scientists and anthropologists. It seems to me that the, the Department of History is not that good at doing history in the University of Cyprus. But I just want to uh, proceed to the two. It's about the simple problem every day. It's not the history of science. Excuse me. Um, but just two very brief questions. One about Costas. Actually, it was about Yorgos, but since you're here, I'll to you. Um, I <laughs> and I, I know that. Um, I know that. Um, Yorgos is involved in this NGO of revival, reviving the, the secret Maronite dialect and stuff like that. And a bit of um, following up of what Berber was saying about the Yorgosophilia. I wonder how, how artificial is this effort? How successful it is? I mean, what, what, does it make any sense? I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that we should um, override the, the dialect or something, but I just want your uh, opinion about what, how it works, how does it serve, and I mean, what about the, the identity issues in terms of generation? I mean, maybe the only guy, the, the young guy that we saw in the film, like the real young guy, was the guy that said, ah, well, it's my patrida, <laughs> <laughs> whatever. So just, just, it's, uh, and what about, because um, it's very brief, I have to say I like very much this, um, this application, and not because we're friends, but because it's, <laughs> I think it kind of creates a great balance between um, between elaboration and accessibility. And I'm, uh, personally, this is what I'm, I'm looking for, actually. And my question is very simple: Why is this just a pilot thing? I mean, how how is it going to evolve, or what are your new sources? I mean, is there a future into this? Thank you. Thank you. Um, Costa, would you like to start? Thank you. Uh, it starts with Daphne and it's here to more general. Daphne, it's, um, you, you probably know that there is, there is an attempt, it's a constant attempt, we, we register in the field, constant effort to protect and divide the language. Uh, you are asking whether it's an artificial or not. Of course it's artificial. Uh, reviving highly endangered in some cases, almost extinct languages around the world. It's an artificial process. The debate is whether this is worth doing or not. Some claim, even in such cases, is important because it is a question of registering identity. is a, a question of justice. People who have lost their language, heritage, etc. Uh, there is a big internal debate within the Marmar community. And you could sense it in the other, in the debate that you saw in the field. Uh, I can tell you a lot about the language. There is even a, uh, currently, I mean, a committee uh, appointed by the, by the Council of Ministers in order to protect and revive the language. This is a committee that was created because of obligations that the Republic of Cyprus has to the European Council. But there are debates, it's not just a government problem. There are debates within the Maronites. If we are going to revive, would it be the purest revival of this peripheral Arabic language? Or do we want to be closer to Arabic, modern Arabic, in which case it would not be the language 
de un pisici de mare aplic, la de la de de oral language that they have in Roma Guinness. And you have a debate we we leave the community whether we need a functional language or whether we need to revive the language of our ancestors, which we didn't have time to go in the field. But uh, it's a it's a highly interesting debate. And of course, touching on some of the issues that a number of you have said, what is very important is not to uh, morally coerce the young people to adopt this identity. That's why I was talking about self identification. However, I would not for a moment say that they need to be denied the possibility of having that identity because the government has treated it as surplus. So they should have that possibility, but they should not be morally, neither legally nor morally coerced mm. to become Maronites if they don't feel that. Uh, I agree with Sia, just say you need your historians, but you need geography as well. Yes, of course. So yes, of course. Of course. Time, yes. space, to yes. see what yes. where community has been, uh, exactly. has been identified and modeled in different places. Perfect. Yes. To save the, the smells. Because <laughs> 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 um, they, 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 they sell some herbs here. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for your questions. I think the, the, the two questions that, that combine uh, are about again how do we how do we access right these sounds uh, and there are two there are two there are two different uh, fields here. One is the history of sound, and the other one is sound history. I think we're more more interested in sound history than the history of sound because the history of sound is precisely trying to recreate or understand exactly how sounds sounded. And for that, you need people who are interested in sound engineering and things like that, and we're not these kind of people. Uh, and actually in the pilot, in the beginning, we did a mistake, <laughs> and, and we paid uh, you know, dirty for this, because every time we showed the pilot, people were asking precisely this question. In one of the uh, points where you can uh, one of the timelines, in the initial timeline of the mosque, we, we included uh, a recording of a muezzin from the, from the beginning of the century. And then everybody was like, okay, where are the other sounds? You know, where is the sound of the drum? Where is it? And we were like, oh, you know, we realized that that was not the direction that we wanted this to take. Again, we're not interested in sound engineering. It's, it's fantastic. You know, there are people, uh, Emily Thompson from you know, Princeton, for example, she's, she's doing an amazing job recreating, she has this uh, pilot, no, it's not a pilot actually, it's a, it's a website called the Roaring Twenties, and it's about the noise in New York, in the, in, in the various noises in the twenties, but she is somebody who, before becoming a historian, was a sound engineer, and she has all these accesses, and of course she got a MacArthur grant, which was, I don't know, five million dollars for this. So, that all helps. So, we're more, again, we're more interested in the history of sound, and, um, uh, sorry, sound history, and that goes to, to what Nicolas, also to Nicolas' question. We use similar sources, that's, and that's what I try to show here. Um, but the questions, that, and, that, and that's, one of the first things that, that we learn as historians, right? What kind of questions do you pose on your sources? So this is precisely what we try to do. We try to pose a different question on our sources, which is, um, it has to do with sound. And we try to listen rather than read the sources. So, you know, it can be a document, it can be a legal document, it can be a monument. We're trying to, to listen and we're trying to, again, understand from, as you said, the, I don't know, how many times there is a prayer, the schedule of the trums, the, the periodicity in, that this created in people's lives, and how people in different communities understood these different sounds, which punctuated their everyday life. Uh, and for some people, for example, you know, I don't know, the, the prayer, the call to prayer, the exam, was sheer noise. For others, 
you know, it, it really was the most important thing in terms of their everyday life. Um, we have amazing things in, in the press regarding the tram, people complaining when uh, the horse the horses are replaced by the electrical tram. And there are all these complaints about we cannot hear the tram any longer and there are accidents. Uh, you know, things like this. When you when you try to you know, things that normally when you read the press of, of the time, you wouldn't really care so much, they became rather than peripheral central uh, to us. Um, the future of the that, that, that's that's thanks for also for the the confidence, in the, in the form of confidence. Um, we, we got a, a lot of positive feedback, which is very good. Actually, the project got a, uh, an award of the most innovative project uh, at the Daraya workshop in Lausanne this summer, which was very good. Uh, but uh, we, the, the, the working group is still there. We have uh, many ideas. The, one of the ideas is to expand it to the entire city rather than to this one thing, and this one monument. We need money, so we are applying for, we are applying for uh, uh, grants right now. But we definitely, the idea is not to keep it as a pilot, but to, to expand it definitely. Thank you. Murad, is there anything that you want to add? Yeah, in this case, I'm sure to question about the I'm an oral historian, and I realized that what that I was reading my transcripts again, listening to the to 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 the, to the interviews and their tempos and their accents and their breaths and their silences is a fantastic exercise, even for an oral historian. But but I'm going back to what you were saying. It's true. We're so much used to visuality. So thank you. Can we continue? Well, please.